I think I'm on live, but I'm not even sure. Let's see. I don't see any comments. So, oh, I think three people are on, but I don't see any comments. Ah, okay. If somebody could please write something so I know that you hear me and this is working, uh, maybe tell me where you're watching from. I see Mindy Levy's watching. Hi. <laughs> okay, do you hear me? I see if I can find some comments. Uh, okay. I think I'm ready to go ahead and start. Renee, can you shoot me a comment to make sure you see me? I don't see any comments yet, but I'll go ahead and start. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Lori Banoff Kaufman, and I'm thrilled to be here today. It's very exciting. Uh, I love this group. I uh, think it's a very supportive group. I've gotten great book recommendations, and it's really so, uh, so great to be here. I feel like I should be. Okay, I see you're commenting, Renee, but I don't see any comments. So maybe it just takes a minute to, to show up. Um, okay. So I don't see anyone's comments or questions yet, but I will, let's see, go ahead. Okay. I'll go ahead and start. I don't see anyone's comments, but um, hopefully they will start scrolling. I see who's watching, but I don't see any comments yet. Okay, so I wanna tell you about my book, Rebel Daughter. Um, I think uh, the, most, uh, the, the best place to start is how I got the idea for it. And the inspiration for Rebel Daughter came from an amazing discovery. It was the 2,000-year-old gravestone of a Jewish woman uh, that was discovered in the Bay of Naples. And she'd been captured after the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, sold as a slave in Rome, and freed by her owner who fell in love with her. And as soon as I heard about this incredible story, I wanted to know more. How did a Jewish woman and a Roman man whose peoples were fierce enemies find each other and fall in love? And this was the seed for the, uh, for the book and that turned into 10 years later, well, actually 12 years later, because it took me 10 years to research and write, and then another uh, two in the publishing pipeline. Uh, and this was the book that came out. Um, so uh, this is gonna be difficult if I can't find any comments, because I wanna know, I, I would love this to be interactive and to answer your questions. And I see who's watching, but I don't see where anyone's written anything. So that's, um, hmm. I know another author had, a, had trouble with that once. Okay. Um, well, hi everybody. I'm sorry I can't see any of your questions. 
Um, maybe if I turn on the computer at the same time, I can see, I'll be able to see the questions. Um, um, maybe Renee, you can shoot me some of the questions on Messenger because those for some reason I'm seeing. Anyway, um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the research project. I spent uh, 10 years trying to research this story. And the reason it took me so long is uh, I felt an obligation to my characters, to, they were real people, to really tell their story as accurately as I could. Um, and also to my readers, I'm an avid reader, like I'm sure many of you, of historical fiction. And the first thing I want to know when I finish reading a novel is how much of this was true. And I'm always a little bit disappointed when I find out that the author completely um, you know, changed history to make it fit a story because I feel like the history is usually so exciting, so interesting that I want to know that what I learned is, is actually true. So I felt uh, very committed to telling the story as accurately as I could. Um, and I was never really interested in ancient history. This is a story that takes place in the first century. Um, but um, for me, history kind of ended in World War II and maybe the Civil War. I'm from originally from Charleston, South Carolina, so I'm, I know about the Civil War and interested in that, but I didn't really connect to uh, antiquity. And when I started researching this, I became um, just drawn in. There was so much about this time period that um, paralleled our world today. And uh, that just drew me in, even though so much of, um, of their life was different, their beliefs and, and the way of life, yet um, so much really was the same. First of all, people are the same. Um, people still want to protect their families, live their lives in freedom and dignity. They want to find love. So I connected to the people that I was reading about. And I also connected to the, to the time because the, uh, I'd say the religious fanaticism and the civil discord, unfortunately, are very relevant uh, still today. So there was so much about this period that I thought would be foreign and actually, the more I learned about it, the more I realized it was a little bit more similar to life today, 2,000 years later, than we really want to want to realize. Um, I'm still not seeing any comments from anybody. I can see who's watching, but I don't see the comments. So. Um, I think I'm going to have to turn on my computer, guys. I'm really sorry that this is, uh, I thought that I had figured this out. Um, okay, let's see if we can get this going. Um, I need it. Oh, oh, yes, I do have a comment. Sorry, okay, now it's working. Sorry. Um, Ellen is saying, your book sounds interesting. I've never been interested in, in ancient history. Right. Well, I never was either um, until I started reading about it. And um, the other thing that was really interesting to me um, when, I, when I think about historical fiction is I very much want to hear the forgotten voices in, of history the women, the children, the slaves, the people that we don't really hear about, the ordinary people who are maybe caught up in extraordinary circumstances. So um, those, are, those are the people that I most want to hear about. And this was a time period that um, we've learned about 
from you know maybe religious studies or um, in history, but we never learn about it from a woman's point of view, as, or a young woman's point of view especially. And so that was also something that I wanted to explore. I had learned a little bit about the first century, um, especially in Israel, you hear a lot about Masada and that there were heroes and they were willing to commit suicide rather than become slaves. And there are a lot of myths around this whole time period. And when you look at it from a historical perspective, you realize that a lot of the, the stories and the messages that we were taught are just wrong historically. Um, the people at Masada were not brave, courageous, I mean, they were brave, but they were also crazy religious fanatics and it was kind of senseless what they did. Um, they were a, a pretty bloodthirsty, uh, bad bunch of people up there. Um, so kind of re-evaluating a lot of the, uh, the myths of the first century. Um, so Renee's asking that it took 10 years to write the book. So it did take 10 years to write the book. I was not working full time, I have to say, on the book. Um, I wanted to write, but I'm not an, I, I don't consider myself, and especially 10 years ago, I didn't, I didn't think I was an author um, or that I even could be an author. And I, I kind of got pulled into it, and I always loved reading and um, playing around with words, but I never believed that, you know, or at least in the beginning, that a book would come out of this. So I didn't commit to it fully. I also felt like it was a little indulgent to say, or, or even to write a book. Um, there's always something else you could be doing, and I'm sure many of you can connect to this. I mean, I have four kids, they're grown now, but um, when they were younger, I had a lot, um, I had a lot to do. And uh, during these, you know, the years, a lot of family health issues and um, other work that I was working full time or uh, on other projects. And so I felt like it was a little bit indulgent to say I'm writing a book. So it was a lot of stolen moments, um, but what I realized is the stolen moments eventually do add up. Um, so Renee is asking, was it hard to get published? Um, it wasn't hard to get published for me, but it was hard to write the book. Um, I, like I said, it took 10 years and then I basically got the agent um, within a weekend almost. I sent her the book on uh, Thursday and Saturday night I had the offer and two weeks later I had the contract with Random House. Um, so that went very, very quickly, but then it took two years from the time that Random House took the book until it became a book. Um, it was supposed to come out right before the presidential election and the publishers postponed it because they said no one's reading a book, we're all reading about Trump, and um, then the pandemic. So it got pushed, it pushed off. Um, Ellen's asking, how did I find the right agent? Um, there's basically only one agent in Israel that most people go to, and so I sent the book to her, Deborah Harris, and, um, if she had said no, I probably would have had more of a, a struggle, but she said yes right away. Michelle says, you don't sound Israeli. When did you move to Israel? I've lived here for almost 36 years. My husband and I came right after grad school. Um, um, Mindy's asking, was it difficult to come up with the characters? Well, I started with two real people. As like I said, the book is based on um, a gravestone that a man put up, a Roman man put up to the woman he loved, a Jewish woman, his freed slave. And I started with them. And then I tried to imagine her family and 
that's how I came up with the characters. Um, what advice do I have for aspiring writers? Linda is asking. Um, you know, I feel I have a bit of imposter syndrome because I should be where you are, chopping up the salad right now for dinner, leaving this open, trying to pick up some tidbits, thinking, you know, there's got to be some secret. So I don't feel like I'm in a position to offer such sage advice. I think everyone has to find their own path. Um, I would say that um, I probably should have had more guts to try writing and not waiting until I was 50 to start. So to be a debut author at age 61 is, um, it's wonderful and it's exciting, but it does make me feel like maybe if I had uh, tried a little earlier and been more committed and believed in it more, that it wouldn't have taken quite so long. So I say, um, you know, be, be brave, be bold, believe in yourself. I know it sounds a little cliche-ish, but I think um, as women and as mothers, we tend to put everybody else first. And it, it's, um, it's exciting to, to finish a book. I think even just finishing is a huge accomplishment. And, you know, it's, so my advice is to keep, keep doing it. And um, did you know how you wanted the book to end when you started it, Phyllis asks. Um, well, I did know her trajectory. Um, I, the book is based, again, on the gravestone, a 2,000-year-old gravestone of a Jewish woman who was captured after the fall of the Second Temple in the first century. And I knew from the gravestone what happened to her um, because it said that she died at a certain age, I don't want to give away too much. So I had the trajectory of her life. And this was such an exciting, um, fascinating uh, hundred years because not only did it uh, change Jewish history, the course of Jewish history, but all of human history. I mean, the seeds of Christianity were planted during this era. Um, there was, um, so much about what happened in the first century um, that um, I think um, it, it kind of, in a certain way, it wrote the book for, for me because I just had to put my character in, in these events, which was completely historically plausible that she would have been. If she were born in Jerusalem, she would have seen the, um, the fighting before the revolt. I mean, what happened basically is she was born in Jerusalem, which was at that time a small province called Judea on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire, a small remote province. And this province, which where the Jews lived, they decided they were going to revolt against Rome. And this was completely crazy considering they had no army. It would be like today, um, you know, a small country um, declaring war on the United States and Russia and China. They had no, no chance. So I just wanted to understand why, why would they do that? What was behind this? Um, did they really think that they were going to beat Rome? And that was such a fascinating um, avenue of exploration. And then to add the characters there and, and, and put them in this fascinating piece of history, the story came alive. Um, do I have another book in the works? Okay, so now that I've written one book and I know that it's possible, I feel like I can take the time to say I'm writing. Um, I don't have to feel like there's always something else that I should be doing. I mean, you can always be cleaning the mold out of the vegetable drawer, right? I mean, you can always be doing another load of laundry. And if you feel like you're doing something just for yourself, I know many of you probably 
create, maybe you don't write, but maybe you're gardening or you're, you're baking or you're painting or you're doing ceramics, something in it, at some point you feel like, well, maybe this is just for me and I don't have the right to, to take the time away from the family or away from everything else and write. And, um, you know, I, I am now feeling like, okay, I'm justified in taking the time to say I'm writing another book because now, okay, she's a writer. This is, this is a real job. Um, I may not make any money out of it and I probably won't, but it's still, it has a, um, a more professional uh, feel to it than it did before when I was just kind of, you know, doing it on the sides. Um, where was I born? I was born in New Orleans and I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, was the title always Rebel Daughter? No, the title was not Rebel Daughter. And I'd be very curious to know what you guys think of the title. My title was Daughter of Jerusalem. Oh, Mindy says, you love the title, great. Um, I wanted it to be Daughter of Jerusalem, which was from the Song of Songs. And the publisher said that no one will buy a book with Jerusalem in the title. Um, so they, they suggested Rebel Daughter. Um, so um, that was that. Was that. Um, I also, um, oh, the cover. You love the cover. Um, I didn't have a say in the... Uh, I didn't have much of a say in the cover, um, but I'm glad that you like it. I was so concerned with historical accuracy, and I knew that in that time period, a young woman would not go anywhere with bare arms and, and her hair uncovered. So I wanted it to be historically accurate, but um, that, that didn't fly. Um, will you keep writing in this genre of ancient historical fiction, Ivy asks. It's a good question. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but I am talking to a, um, uh, another professor who is a professor of early Christianity, Paula Fredrickson, and, um, you know, trying to convince her that maybe we should write something about, um, St. Augustine and the Jews was a very interesting story there, or maybe um, some of the early Christians. But I'm leaning now towards writing a story based um, on my grandmother's life in Charleston, South Carolina at the turn of the century. She had uh, four sisters and they were all kind of uh, interesting, I'd say, crazy. Um, and they had a lot of exciting adventures. And I'm, I'm very interested in the question of gender and um, identity, you know, and at that period of time, women were also struggling with many of the issues that Esther in the first century was struggling with. You know, um, in the 1900s, um, immigrants were, were they immigrants? Were they Jews? Were they American? They very much wanted to be American. And I think a lot of the um, identity issues you know, in one point, Esther says, you know, with men, I'm a, women, a woman, with, um, with Jerusalemites, I'm um, considered from this neighborhood, you know, who am I really? And I think that's a question that um, always fascinates me for women in any time period. Um, do I have a favorite author? Um, I have a lot of favorite authors, I think. Um, but I love reading short stories. Um, there's something about the short story, maybe because I have maybe not a lot of patience, but I'm just blown away by some short story writers. And I love um, Alice Munro, um, who I thought I discovered, but she won a Nobel Prize in 2013. So I guess other people knew about her too. I love her work because um, she's able to capture so much of the inner lives of, of women. And her writing is so, um, say, not pretentious. Um, and 
I almost read her short stories, I'd say, as a palate cleanser between books. Sometimes uh, I find that some of the commercial um, women's fiction, um, even though I love it, is, is sometimes I, I read a book and I feel like it's a little bit emotionally manipulative or formulaic, and then I read um, some of Alice Munro and everything is so understated and her, her um, prose is so crisp and um, plain, but there's so much behind it and I just, I love reading that. So I think she's one of my favorites. I also love the short stories of Laurie Moore. If um, you haven't read any of those, I would so um, encourage you to pick up some of her, her books. Uh, she has one, one story um, about uh, a pediatric oncology ward, which was, would, is the most um, unfunny place you can imagine, of course, and yet the story has humor and, and pathos, and it's just the whole range of human emotions is in there. And the short stories have, um, that I love have authentic characters, they have a plot, they have a theme, it's almost everything a novel has, but so compressed. And so every word has to be the perfect word. So um, when you ask about favorite authors or favorite books, I, I really do very much like short story collections. Um, oh, Ivy says, I love the idea of my grandmother and the Jewish women of, in the South. Again, women in interesting times is, um, you know, I, I do like reading from the women's perspective. That obviously, I guess I, you know, identify more with a woman's experience. Um, and I love, re I love learning history. I just feel like, um, I don't know, it, it transports me. I've always been fascinated with the idea of time travel too. So um, Michelle, thank you, said you're, it was different and interesting. I'm so thrilled for me to have this contact with real readers is just, you know, um, so exciting because again, I feel like I should be where you are looking at the authors. And, I, and I've looked at all the, I've, I watched the Facebook Live with the authors and to me, those are the serious authors. And I feel like, um, you know, I've just had such a, a different life. Um, and I, I do wonder sometimes if I had started uh, writing earlier what would have happened. Um, I uh, just finished the Midnight Library because I read so many wonderful reviews on Renee's site. And those of you have um, Matt Haig's uh, book where um, the character is reading the different versions of her life, what, what could have happened. And um, my husband and I, in 1985, wrote a book, The Ice Cream Lover's Guide to Boston, which was published. And after that, we had a con we had an agent and we had a contract to write The Dessert Lover's Guide of New York. And I was pregnant with my first son, my first child, and we my husband had a job in Israel, and we ended up not writing that and not going into writing. And I always, after I read the book, The Midnight Library, I thought, hmm, I wonder if I had actually started writing seriously then, you know, maybe I would be, um, you know, more like Susan Meissner or Kate Quinn or one of the other uh, super successful historical novelists uh, today. So, uh, but then of course, maybe I wouldn't have my four children or, you know, you never, you never know. And of course you always imagine, you know, what if I had taken this path instead of that path? So um, it, is, it is something that, that I do think about. Um, yet Ellen asked if I lived in Boston at the time I wrote the ice cream book, of course. And not only did we live there, but we went to every single ice cream store almost in the whole state. And um, we had a book signing at uh, the Harvard Coop and we were on TV and radio. I mean, this was a serious, uh, serious research project, almost as serious as researching the first century. Um, so uh, someone asked if my children read the book. Um, I have, I'd say I have, uh, um, 
like I said, four kids. My oldest is 36, 33, 30, and 20, um, and only two read it, so. Um, and you guys have very uh, supportive comments. I find that something about this group that I love. I always feel like when I, um, when I'm on the group that I'm with a bunch of great friends and we're actually almost like having this coffee together, just talking about books, which I love, love talking about books. And I wasn't even very big on social media before I came out with the book. I always thought it was a bit of a, a time waste and, and it wasn't, you can't make real connections. And since I've been on Renee's group, I've met really fabulous women. I've started corresponding with many of you and um, it's been wonderful. So um, let's say the moving sliding doors. Um, yes, someone's writing about that, about one instant your world, you change everything. Yeah, I, I still just, you know, keep thinking about that, um, you know, uh, because like many of you, um, I've had a kind of windy career path. Um, after we moved to Israel, I um, spent most of my uh, career as a marketing strategy consultant, mainly for high-tech companies, um, military companies that were trying to commercialize their technology. I even tried to invent a device to kill headlights. <laughs> um, so really crazy, crazy things before I came out with, with the writing. Um, Someone said they're coming to Israel in May. Great, you'll definitely call me. And I am doing book talks in Israel. I uh, was in Jerusalem last night at a, a book club there, and that was that was a lot of fun. Um, the one thing about this book that was uh, so fascinating was because I live in Israel, I was able to go to the places where my characters were and walk on the same stones that Esther walked on. Um, and if any of you have been to Israel, I'm sure many of you have, the Western Wall, you know, you, you touch the stones that they could have touched. And so many of the recent archeological excavations are in, my, are in the book. Um, the tunnels underneath the Temple Mount are now open. And, and you can see where the, um, the Jews tried to escape when the Romans were, were coming. Um, there's also a home in Jerusalem. It's called the Burnt House. You walk in there and you're walking back in time, 2,000 years. You can see the ash and the soot on, soot on the, the walls where the fires were. And, and when you walk in, you, you imagine um, the battle that must have taken place there. And there's a skeleton of a, there's an arm and a, with a, a hand, the bones that's on the ground. And it's been identified as a woman's uh, arm from uh, who's about 20 years old it, near the kitchen. And, and you can just think, okay, the Romans were, you know, came into the house um, with the torches lit the young woman was in the kitchen. She tried to escape, maybe ran up the staircase. Her hand is, is grasping at the stairs and it's just there. So you see it. And those were the kinds of things that I could see because I live here. So um, I really felt like I could um, walk in the very footsteps of, um, of my characters. And that was very exciting. The other thing was, because I was here, I was able to consult with many world experts um, of this time period, archeologists, scholars, historians. And I uh, worked very closely with uh, one professor um, in particular, Jonathan Price, who, who wrote the author's note at the back of the book. And he is an expert on Josephus, who if any of you have read the book, know that he's a character in the book. Um, and um, you know, we worked very closely and made sure that everything was historically accurate, which is another reason it took me so long. And I think I did overshoot 
the research. I don't think most people or most authors would, would care as much, but because I was working with these world-class scholars and I knew they would read the book, I, I, I knew I had to get it right. So much so that, I mean, there's one scene in the book, a riot scene, and I knew that it happened in the morning and I wanted it to happen in the afternoon and I didn't, I, I made it happen in the morning when it happened in real life. Um, I used Josephus, um, who's a Jewish historian, um, who actually switched sides and became Roman, and that's his stories in the book. Um, he was an eyewitness to, to everything that happened, so he was my main, my main source. Um, Harriet, you're coming to Israel. Great. All right, we'll, we'll take this one offline and I'll be happy to tell you about that. Um, and I'm just getting some, feeling the love from out there, all of you guys uh, being so supportive. So thank you so much, uh, Rosalie, Judy, Bonnie, thank you. It's, uh, it's great talking with you all, even though it's very weird because I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I, and I know you're there, but I, I I think it would be feel a little more natural if I could actually talk to you. Um, so I'm trying to think what else I can tell you about. Um, what other questions? You're asking what time it is, okay? It is about, ah, 2.30. So I think we'll wrap this up. It's 2.35 here in the morning. I ate a lot of chocolate and drank a lot of coffee before this, so I would be, uh, you know, up to talk. I hope I wasn't too rambly. I'm probably a little sharper earlier in the day. But again, thank you so much for, for coming in. Um, and it's been a pleasure. Uh, I think, Renee, unless anyone else has some questions, uh, we, we should probably call it a night. Um, Okay, so there are a couple more questions. So um, I'll say goodbye to everybody that wants to leave and whoever wants to stay on, I'm happy to stay on and answer a few more questions. Mindy asks if I speak Hebrew. Well, not as well as I should, even though I have lived here for 35 years. Has living in Israel piqued your interest in Jewish history? Definitely. Um, but I would like to say that this book is also resonating very much for uh, Christian audiences because the destruction of Jerusalem is very important in early Christianity and um, I think uh, it, there's a lot there for um, non-Jews as well who would be very interested in it. Thank you so much. It was really wonderful talking to you all and I hope we get to meet and if you do buy the book or, or get the book from the library, I would so appreciate it if you would write an Amazon review for a new unknown author, um, the Amazon reviews or the book, the Goodreads make a tremendous difference. Each review raises the, uh, the book in the search engine hundreds of places and um, that would be very, very helpful for me. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining. Bye.